everyone, my name's Abby Tipler and I'm one of the surgeons at Veterinary Specialist Services. Today we're going to be discussing medial patella luxation. And this talk is actually divided into two parts. The first part looks at the etiology of the disease and how we can accurately diagnose and grade a luxating patella. And then in the second part, we look at treatment options and how we can reduce the incidence of complications. If you have any questions about these talks, which can be found in the vet resource area of our website, then please let us know. I hope you enjoy and we'll get started talking about medial patella luxation. So let's talk firstly a little bit about how a patella comes to be a luxating one, i.e. the etiology of medially luxating patella. So for a patella to function, it needs to have a proper alignment with its attachments. So the cranial thigh muscles, i.e. the quadriceps muscle group, need to meet and converge on the patella, which should sit centrally in its trochlear groove. Then the patella is attached to the patella tendon, which inserts on the tibial tuberosity. And all of this should be in a relatively straight line in normal dogs. And this whole mechanism is called the extensor apparatus. And when it is aligned, the mechanism works to effectively and painlessly extend the knee via contraction of the quadriceps. And if this mechanism is not in a straight line, then the patella does not sit within the groove or it may flick in and out of the groove, resulting in cartilage damage and pain. And unfortunately, the exact etiology of medial luxating patella is unknown, but we do know that as puppies, they are born with normal stifles. And then there are abnormal forces across the growth plate during growth, but it's unclear whether or not this is due to fibrosis or contracture of some of the medial thigh muscles or abnormal conformation at the level of the hip. But overall, medial malalignment of the quadriceps mechanism leads to these abnormal forces during growth and what results is a varying degree of angular bony deformities um, developing in both the femur and the tibia. And this is an extreme example um, here on the screen on the left hand side. And so what we end up left with is a patient with varying degrees of bony conformational abnormalities. And some of the bony abnormalities that we typically see are torsion of the tibia with internal rotation, distal femoral varus, which is where the femur curves towards the midline distally, hyperplasia of the medial condyle, which of course accentuates any distal femoral varus, patella ulta, which is where the patella sits more proximally than normal, and also underdevelopment of the trochlear groove. And we may not see all of these conformational abnormalities, and they may be seen at varying degrees of severity. So let's briefly discuss the epidemiology. And this is mainly a disease of small breeds, such as Chihuahuas, Poodles, Yorkies, Silky Terriers, uh, Papillons and Pomeranians. But it's also seen in larger breeds, such as Labradors, Staffordshires and Bull Terriers. Females tend to be slightly overrepresented, and around 50 to 60% of the time it's bilateral. And of course this makes sense, as often the deformities are in both limbs. 80% of luxations are either a grade 2 or a grade 3, and we'll talk about grading in a minute. And around 10 to 40% of dogs have a concurrent cruciate ligament injury. And in a dog that has an MPL um, or has had an MPL for a while and then becomes suddenly lame, a cruciate ligament rupture should be high on the list of differentials. Uh, MPL has also been associated with trauma resulting in angular limb deformity uh, or sur surgical repair of the cruciate ligament and previous fractures and malunion. So, so take a, th a thorough history just to see if any of these factors apply. And then we also occasionally see uh, a case in a breed that does not typically have an MPL and has no bony abnormalities but is suddenly lame and has a patella luxation. And this may be a case of a true traumatic patella luxation and results from tearing of the lateral joint capsule or supporting structures. And in our experience this is quite rare and most dogs, even those that present acutely, have a predisposition and often when we take radiographs we see that there was a degree of bony abnormality present that we need to address. So there's a grading system for luxating patella and the grade of luxation is related to not only the prognosis but also the recommended surgical treatment options and the grade is between 1 and 4. So how do we examine the animal to effectively establish a grade? Well, firstly, it's important to examine the dog's stance and gait. So look for any detectable lameness or especially a skipping lameness. 
Look to also see if they are in a crouched position, which can sometimes be seen in dogs that can't activate their extensor mechanism to extend the stifles to stand normally. Now, secondly, is our musculoskeletal examination. And this needs to also include an assessment of cranial draw and cranial tibial thrust, which are not always seen with a cruciate rupture, but should be assessed, if not at the initial exam, then certainly when the patient is anaesthetized or sedated for radiographs. Then I find the best way to examine the patella is with the patient facing away from me. And here I'm demonstrating on my own dog, Bitsa Maloney, who sits in my office. And I usually firstly attempt to luxate the patella with the dog in the normal standing position. And then I lift the pelvis, which will often extend the leg and release the quadriceps mechanism. And this should make it easier to luxate the patella, um, or it may even spontaneously luxate with the leg extended. So in terms of grading, I've always had a way of remembering it, which you may or may not find helpful, but it's basically that grade one wants to be in and grade three wants to be out. So one wants to be in, three wants to be out. So a grade one luxating patella kind of wants to be within the groove. So the patella can be manually luxated, especially with the stifle and extension, but it tends to sort of immediately return back to the trochlear groove. Grade twos tend to move freely in and out of the groove um, and are typically palpated within the groove when you go to first palpate them. When you manipulate the patella out of the groove, however, it does not spontaneously re return as in a grade one. A skipping lameness is quite common with your grade twos and threes. A grade three luxation is where the patella wants to be out of the groove. So it can be manually reduced, but otherwise it's permanently luxated. And when you go to first palpate um, the patella, it's sitting out of the groove. And then finally, a grade four is where the patella is permanently luxated and is non-reducible. And it's important to note that with increasing grade, the associated bony abnormalities are generally more severe and difficult to treat. And grade four luxations can require more advanced procedures such as a distal femoral osteotomy. Then finally, after our gait and clinical examination, we want to sedate or anaesthetize the patient for radiographs. And I think it might be worth pausing here to talk a little bit about the importance of taking quality radiographs. So this is a picture of us taking a lateral stifle radiograph on the left. The dog's in lateral recumbency with the contralateral limb pulled forwards and held with a sandbag. And then on the right is the craniocaudal view with the contralateral limb also pulled forwards and this needs to be elevated on a sandbag to provide counterbalance for this view. So for your craniocaudal radiograph, you want the fabella to bisect the femoral condyles. Um, and you can see that that's been achieved in both femurs um, for this particular radiograph. And then distally, you want the medial edge of your calcaneus bisecting your distal intermediate ridge, which is this ridge here. And you can see in this case that that's not the case um, for this radiograph. However, uh, one thing to look out for is that the femur here is relatively straight. And so it may be that um, the reason why we, we don't have a straight hock is that there's actually some tibial torsion. And that's quite common as we know in these cases. So that's, that's something to look out for. And if there's significant torsion, then that may be best assessed by a CT scan. And you'll also see in this radiograph um, that the right tibial tuberosity appears to veer medially and that the patella is not centered within the femur. And there's an overall appearance that these limbs are bowed outwards and this is called genuvarum. Uh, and this particular dog had bilateral grade two luxating patellas. So you want to get used to looking at your radiographs in the same direction. So for a lateral radiograph, you want the dog to be facing towards the left. Then for the cranial caudal radiographs, the dog is facing towards you. So for a left cranial caudal view, lateral is towards the right. So if you can't remember, this is my own dog again, Bitsa. Um, and when you're trying to remember, think of his beautiful face staring out of the screen towards you. And of course, his left lateral side is on the right and vice versa.
And the other thing we want to be assessing when we look at our radiographs is the degree of bony deformity. And this is especially true for our higher grades of patella luxation. So you can see in these radiographs on the left that the femur is relatively straight. However, on the right, the distal femur deviates medially, and this is called distal femoral virus. And it can be quantified using the CORA methodology, which we won't go into. And these cases with significant distal femoral virus may require an additional um, deformity correction, um, and they're generally more difficult cases. So watch out for these, and it's more common with our higher grades of patella luxation. So in summary, the etiology of medial patella luxation is complex, but ultimately we are left with bony deformities that require correction. In terms of grading, grading can help with determining the risk of complications, and in some cases the types of procedures that we may need to consider, which we'll discuss in a separate talk. Remember that grade 1 wants to be in, but you can push it out, and grade 3 wants to be out, but you can push it in, in very unscientific terms. Uh, at grade two is in between, and four, you can't even manually return the patella to the groove. So that's how I like to remember it. It's important to take well-positioned radiographs to assess for these bony abnormalities and to help determine the complexity of the confirmation and required treatment. So I hope you'll join us um, when we talk about treatment and complications of MPL repair in our next talk. And thanks for listening.